welcome back students so we will continue our transition to the plasticity of material this part of the content so far we have seen the elastic behavior we have seen the tensile properties tensile testing the utm now we will move on to the plastic behavior of the material so with respect to that first let's get acquainted with the concept of flow stress this content has been covered in chapter 5 by Osford and Cadell. Now, if you took a look at typical stress strain curve, this is how it will look like. Let's draw it. Okay, so I have drawn an somewhere before the until before the UTS. And uh, to be precise, when we are talking about uh, flow stress, usually it would be uh, effective stress that we are talking about. We'll learn more about it as we go around. Okay, so here on the x axis you have stress, on the y axis you have stress, and on the x axis you have strain. Somewhere here you have the yield strength of the material. Though. Let's call it yield strength one because this is the original yield strength of the material. Now, let's say you deform the material all the way up to this point and then you take away the load. So, the material will come back like this, somewhere parallel to this. Yeah, the, the curve that will follow would be something like this. Now, if you start to deform the material again, apply the stress again then you would see that it will follow the same curve back and somewhere over here, you would have yield strength two. Now let's say here, this is again a place where you drop the load. So it will come back like this, parallel to the elastic modulus. And then again, if you want to load it up, so it will follow the same curve and this time its yield strength would be higher. So yield strength three. So what you would observe is that yield strength three is greater than yield strength two is greater than yield strength one. Meaning strength usually increases with deformation. And uh, as you keep increasing the strain, the yield strength is increasing. So if you could find a locus of the yield strength with the increasing strain, then that would be called flow stress. Or in other words, uh, flow stress is also the instantaneous value of stress required to keep deforming the material. Or like I said, it is also the locus of yield points. This uh, locus of yield points or the instantaneous value of stresses can be or is usually modeled by a very simple relation which is called power law. So model meaning to give a relation or the value of 
flow stress as a function of strain. So this is sigma t, which means sigma true stress is equal to k times epsilon t, which is again true strain to the power n, where sigma t is the flow stress Epsilon T is the true strain and K value is called strength coefficient. And this N is called strain hardening exponent. Keep this term in mind because there is a similar term which people do, students do get confused with and that is strain hardening rate. So that is a different thing. This is strain hardening exponent for which is the N when we are using this power law model. To give you an idea, the value of k and n, let's put them, put the value somewhere here, k, n for aluminum, brass, low carbon steel, and 304 steel. So the values are 180 this is in megapascal for brass it is 895 for low carbon steel it is 530 and for 304 steel it is 1275 n is 0.20 this is 0 0.49 0.26 0.27 so roughly what you would find is that K increases as the strength of the material increases, yield strength or the UTS, and N increases as the ductility of the material increases. You can also plot this equation in online Mathematica. So you can utilize the site Mathematica, which allows you to plot online. And you can, so here the equation which was plotted was sigma equal to 250 into epsilon to the power 0.2. So K was taken as 250 and N was taken as 0.2. And strain value was, as you can see here, varied from 0.0, .0 to 1.0. And the plot you get is something like this. So this, as you can see, truly represent the stress strain behavior for the plastic part. So the flow stress, or you can say the yield point locus with increasing strain. And on the x-axis, you have the strain. Now, there are uh, different variations of uh, this, but before that, let me, I was talking about the strain hardening exponent. So let me, just make it clear, rate of strain hardening. How is it defined? So this, this is defined as d sigma by d epsilon. So the change in flow stress with increase in strain, how quickly it is increasing or how slowly it is increasing, that is what is defined by strain hardening rate or rate of strain hardening. And if you take the equation sigma equal to k epsilon to the power n, then what you get is n times k times epsilon to the power n minus one, which you can also represent as, so this is equivalent to saying this is sigma by epsilon. So this becomes n times sigma by epsilon. 
Now this strain hardening uh, rate is very sensitive to the microstructure. So even one material under different uh, microstructural condition can give you different strain hardening rates. So rate of is very sensitive to microstructure. Again, uh, let me and let me draw it here. So if it were uh, annealed, let's say we will take the example of aluminum alloys. Okay, so if it were uh, aluminum alloy, which is age hardenable, but if it were in an annealed condition, then you would see a very low strain hardening rate, meaning the stress is increasing at a very low rate. On the other hand, if it were aged a little bit, but underaged. So in that case, you don't see very large improvement in strain hardening rate, but what do you, what you do see is improvement in strength. So you would get a stress strain curve, something like this. So here, so let me keep writing. So this is Okay, I will write it at the end so that it doesn't get too crowded. So now we will age it, peak age it. So it will have not only improvement in UTS, but also improvement in strain hardening rate. And you would see something like this. On the other hand, if you keep moving ahead and you over age it, then it may have a very high strain hardening rate, but unfortunately it will have it will not have very high strength. Okay, so now let me give it all a name. So now let me write down the condition names. So this is like solution on yield. This is underaged. This is peak aged. And this is overaged. I'm sorry, this one was the underaged. Sorry for the confusion again. This is overaged and this is peak aged. So again, uh, to remove the confusion, let me describe. This is solution anneal, where you have low strength, very but very good ductility. Then you keep aging the material. Then you see not much improvement in strain hardening rate, but you do see improvement in yield strength and UTS. That is the underaged condition. In peak aged condition, you see improvement in strain hardening rate as well as improvement in UTS. So this is the peak aged condition. And overaged condition, you see an improvement in the strain hardening rate, but the overall strength drops. So this is the overaged condition. And mind you that this is the same material, only different microstructure. And how do we obtain different microstructure? By heating it for different amount of time. So thus, uh, what we clearly see that the rate of strain hardening is very sensitive to microstructure. Now let's uh, look at the variations of this power law model that we have seen. So the one of the simplest, or you can say alternative for, so let me draw two, three of these because we'll need that.
Okay, so a little bit of uh, confusion here because I'm still getting used to this drawing part. Now let me draw the simplest alternative to power law and it is something like this. So on the x, x, uh, y axis you have stress and on the x axis you have strain for all of these. And here your equation is given by sigma equal to y. So whatever is the original yield strength, it remains the same. And this is called also called a perfectly plastic material. The other alternative to the power law is something like this, where it does not, it varies linearly. The yield strength or the flow stress varies linearly. And therefore your equation is given by something like this, a much simpler and cleaner equation. The third alternative is what we already have, which is the power law equation, which we saw when we drew, this is how it came out. Now in the power law equation itself, we can have a little bit of variation. So for example, let's say that there is some amount of pre-straining in the sample. So this is the amount of uh, pre-straining. Then actually the stress starts from here, but you would be seeing because this much amount of strain is already given here. So you would see the changes from over here. And in that case, your equation, because you have received the material at this stage can be transformed into this form. So whatever strain you are giving, you should include epsilon naught in that. And then it can be written like this. The other equation is alternative, is also something you may have uh, seen behavior like this somewhere. And this is exponential type behavior. So it reaches a peak value. And this is given by sigma equal to sigma naught one minus EXP minus A epsilon. So these are some of the alternatives or uh, variations uh, uh, of the power law behavior to represent this stress strain behavior or the flow stress behavior. Okay, so in this respect, let's uh, try to solve one example. So the question is a metal rod is elongated by 24.6% by tensile deformation. If the material behavior is given by sigma equal to 250 epsilon to the power 0.2 megapascal, find the average stress required for this deformation. Okay, so we, what we are given, let's take a look at that. So you are given engineering strain. So you are given E, which is equal to 24.6%. And if you translate it, it becomes 0 0.246. So you will have to translate this to two strain, which is equal to LN one plus E. And when you put in the values, you would find that this translates to value of 0 0.22. Now, when we are also given this equation, sigma equal to 250 epsilon to the power 0.2, where K is equal to 250 and N is equal to 0.2. So if you put this equation over here, we get flow stress value. And this is 250 into 0 0.22 to the power 0.2. And this gets to 184 megapascal. Okay, so is this what they're asking for? And the answer is no. What they're asking is average stress. This is the flow stress at the end of this deformation. So this is not the stress that you were applying throughout. What it is asking is, on an average, how much stress was being applied onto the sample? So how do we obtain that? The relation or to obtain that relation, let's call it YF average, which is the average flow stress. This is basically if the overall strain was epsilon, then this is given by sigma d epsilon. So you are whatever stress you are applying into uh, integral divided by the over by the total strain. And this will give you all roughly average 
amount of flow stress that is required. This is not giving you the maximum stress or the minimum stress. This is giving you on an average this much flow stress is required throughout the process. So in, a, in a, other words, you can say that this flow stress times epsilon would be the same amount of energy as the total amount of energy, which you can see here. Yf average times epsilon will be equal to integral sigma d epsilon. So this energy and this energy would be equal. So that is where the concept of average flow stress is coming from. Now, putting sigma equal to k epsilon to the power n, so k is a constant, we get epsilon to the power n d epsilon, zero epsilon, and this becomes epsilon power n plus one by n plus one, and you have epsilon here. So one gets canceled and you have k epsilon to the power n. So this becomes actually nothing but sigma at epsilon divided by n plus one. And we already have sigma at epsilon. So our solution for this equation becomes very simple. For this particular one, what we need is 184 by one plus n, where n is equal to 0 0.2, so one plus 0 0.2. And therefore this turns out to be 153.9 megapascal. So this is the answer that we are seeking. Now taking this uh, equation further ahead and you are asked what is the yield stress of the material and the final flow stress of the material. So final flow stress we have already obtained, which was the 184 megapascal. Now we have to find the original yield stress of the material. So we know that for original yield stress, strain is equal to 0 0.002. Therefore, all we need to do is insert this to find original yield strength. So this is 250 into 0 0.002 to the power 0.2. And this is 0 0.289 into 250. So this turns out to 72.13 megapascal. This is the yield stress of the material, of the virgin material, meaning when it had no deformation. But then you have to be careful that this power law behavior cannot be applied for, usually not applied for very, very low strain values. So this is not the only limitation. There are some, some other limitations also. So let's look at what are some other limitations uh, of the power law behavior. So this is quite reliable for higher strain but not so reliable when strain values are small. This is something we just emphasized. And usually what is that low strain? So that low strain is less than 0 0.04. And hence, not suitable to predict yield strength of the material. Another uh, limitation is that if the material is already work hardened, the equation needs to be modified, which we have already seen over here when we are looking at so that was earlier. So if equation needs to be modified.
what is that modified equation? Sigma equal to K epsilon plus epsilon naught to the power N. So this is your pre-strain value. Okay, so this gives us a very uh, good idea about the flow stress. There can be good number of numerical questions that can be set up on this. So it will be good for you if you can do some practice on this problem, on these equations, on how to translate from engineering strain to true strain and also to uh, engineering stress to true stress and then use it in the equation to calculate the flow stress behavior. Sometimes you may be given a pre-strain, what, what will be the flow stress or what will be the average flow stress and so on. So these kind of problems can be set up on this particular topic. Okay, so we will close this topic chapter of uh, power law behavior for, or basically the flow stress behavior. And next time when we meet, we will talk about the yield criterion. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm.